Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I want to take you back now a uh, hundred years to 1912. And we think of a century as a long time, but really it's well within uh, our expectations of life for children born today now. Almost exactly a century ago, this is what counted for ship's discovery. This is the Terra Nova in Antarctica uh, crushing into the ice pack. And this is Scott's ill-fated expedition. Scott, 10 decades ago, freezes to death on the Ross ice shelf inside a tent. 12 miles from his place of safety, 12 miles from one ton depot. Why does Scott freeze to death? When you come down to the underlying process of why it kills you, it's really to do with these things. These are called mitochondria. They're inside every cell that you have. They generate the power within your cells. They're sort of biological batteries. They separate charge. They pump charge, positive and negative charge, on either sides of the membranes and create these sort of hundreds of biological batteries in each cell. So Scott dies because the molecular process in his body begins to arrest as the cold takes him down inexorably to a pathway to death. Now, in my travels, I came across uh, another person, Anna Bagenholm, who's quite remarkable, Norwegian 29-year-old skier at the time, who also froze to death. But the difference between her and Scott is she survives the experience. She's out skiing, she catches her edge of her ski, falls onto the back of a very thick covering of ice, slides into a hole, and is trapped in an air pocket between freezing water and the thick layer of ice above. Uh, her colleagues can't pull her out, and uh, she remains trapped there, struggling. And after about 40 minutes of struggling, she is limp and, uh, and, and is not moving anymore, presumably fully uh, arrested at this point. Ski team arrive, break her out of there. She's blue and she's lifeless and has no pulse, and they start resuscitating. Helicopter arrives. At the point at which they arrive at Tromso, she has had a downtime of two hours. So downtime for us is the time since you last had spontaneous output, so spontaneous activity of your own heart. Now, in London, in an A&E unit, if someone comes in with a cardiac arrest, the first thing we ask the crew is, what is the downtime? And if that number is any more than about 20 minutes, we're pretty pessimistic about us getting a person back who is going to live an independent life, because usually by that point, the brain becomes so damaged that they're, they're not going to survive it. And the team, nevertheless, decide to continue with the resuscitation, because her core temperature is extremely low, and they're hoping that the same thing that stopped her heart will also have protected her brain. They take her upstairs, they put her on a heart-lung bypass machine, they warm up her blood, uh, and after another hour of resuscitation, so now three hours before her heart first stopped, since her heart first stopped, her heart starts beating again. And nine months later, that is her. And I've met her, and she's very, very, very impressive. Um, uh, and she survives with almost no residual deficit of any kind, she's got some weakness in the muscles of her left hand. Now, why is she alive? Uh, and you have to ask yourself what happens in the intervening 10 decades that uh, facilitates her survival. And the answer is this massive rate of progress in science, medicine, and technology. Let's take on some of those points very quickly. This is Christian Barnard, 1968, first heart transplant. But the history of heart surgery is outrageously brief and outrageously bold. We did not operate on hearts until the beginning of the 20th century. It was seen as a dynamic organ that was inoperable. And that lasted through World War I. There were some fledgling attempts to operate on the heart of wounded soldiers with no, no real success. It wasn't until World War II when a surgeon called Dwight Harkin arrives, seeing waves and waves of casualties arriving from uh, the, uh, from the uh, D-Day Normandy landings. And Harkin takes this on and operates on 134 separate cases to remove foreign bodies from injured hearts, and nobody dies. And it's that, that episode, that opens the continent of the heart to exploration for everybody. And after that, medicine wastes no time. So it's 45 when he, he does that remarkable series. 48 um, in civilian life, the first closed heart operations happen. And then racing forwards, 19 years later, Barnard and his team are racing to perform the first heart transplant. 
if you take yourself away from the fact that this was medical pioneering, they are exactly the same as Scott, Shackleton, Hillary, any of those people, they have the same character flaws, they have the same motivations, they want to be first. It's not entirely clear uh, that they had the best interest of anyone but their own glory at heart. That's what explorers do. What else does she need? She needs, she needs that because she needs the coronary artery bypass circuit. She needs the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. She needs the machine that removes blood from her body, recirculates it, and warms it up. And that's pioneered specifically for that operation, really. What else does she need? She needs intensive care. And intensive care appears in the 1950s as a way to combat polio, as a way for us to support paralyzed chests and lungs against this virus that, that, that had fallen upon northern European cities, causing profound disability amongst its populations. And these are iron lungs. These are tubes in which a patient whose chest had been paralyzed could lie with their head sticking out of the top and a rubber neck seal around the top and it generates a vacuum inside that effectively sucks your chest open, sucking air into your chest exactly the way that you would suck air into a pair of bellows. The problem with this is uh, each one of these in the 1950s was about the price of a house, so it's not a practical solution for less well-heeled cities and populations. In Copenhagen, when this happens, they have one of these machines uh, and a couple of other more primitive devices. Uh, and so, an anaesthetist, Bjorn Ibsen, says, well, look, what we do in the operating theatres is we send people to sleep and we support their breathing by squeezing a rubber bag with a tube down their windpipe. Surely we can do this to support them through this viral epidemic. And he demonstrates that that will work in 1952, and almost instantly this transforms everything that they do. And he, with that intervention, by replacing the function of an organ system, in this case the lungs, with a manual squeezing of a rubber bag, takes the mortality of that, the number of people who die from that, from 90% uh, and turns it into an 80% survivorship. There is nothing, nothing that we will do in modern medicine that will make that much difference to a single disease entity today. We're just, we're just up against the limits of it at the moment. What else does she need? She needs flying ambulances. Now this, flying ambulances bizarrely come from a time before aviation. Dominic Jean Larre with the armies of France in the 18th century. He says, well, if we only collect them after the battle is over, it's too long. And he knows that people whose care is delayed do less well. And so he repurposes an artillery wagon, uh, and he uses it to carry people off the field of battle during the battle. He does this himself. And these are called dubbed flying ambulances. Now, ambulances, of course, don't fly until the 20th century. And the first air evacuations happened during World War II. In fact, it proliferates during the Korean War by the time of the Vietnam War, it's an iconic site. And the reason that it came into civilian use is because they did the statistics on survivorship of people who were involved in massive road traffic accidents on Californian highways and compared them to the survival of people who were being shot to pieces in East Asian jungles during the Vietnam War, and the people in the war were doing better. And so the first helicopter systems then come into use uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. When I was at medical school 20 years ago, uh, it wasn't really accepted. People still aren't sure that it's the right thing to do, but nevertheless, this is the modern innovation, the point of delivery, the, deliver the care that we deliver in our hospitals extended beyond its walls with immediacy. And that's what it takes to extend survival in these extreme circumstances. Now, it's not just about medical science, this. It's about the engineering that you require to facilitate it. These were the most important fighter aircraft in the Battle of Britain, shot down more enemy aircraft than any other single fighter type. And I show you these because they're differently built from the Spitfire. The Spitfire was an all-metal body by the end. These, the fuselage of these was uh, wooden stringers covered in Irish linen doped with nitrocellulose. There's fuel in the wings, there's fuel in front of the pilot, and when a round of ammunition comes through that fuel tank, flaming fuel pours into your lap, you have your hands on the control column, which you can't let go of, otherwise the plane will crash, and your hands and your face burn, and the, the pilots likened it to sitting in a vehicle uh, at the center of a blowtorch, and indeed these were some of the men who had to endure that. These were and became the most severely injured people from fire who survived that experience in history. And when they returned, there was the question of what one might do with them. The first plan was to institutionalize them away from society, to protect them from society and society from them. And yet a surgeon called Archie McKindo decided that wasn't acceptable. 
and developed the techniques, the early techniques of reconstructive plastic surgery that had been developed by his cousin Harold Gillies during World War I uh, to reconstruct these warriors. And, and they did this with this remarkable technique called the waltzing pedicle. So in those days, because they didn't have microscopes on which to snip out very tiny blood vessels and plug them in at the new site, they did this remarkable thing where they would cut a uh, three-sided rectangle on the abdomen or the chest. They would open that like the rear cover of a book. They would cut a uh, pocket, usually in the arm, and they would tuck the free end of this flap that was kept alive by its primary connection into the arm, and they would stitch it into place and leave them uh, in, with this strange anatomical arrangement for several weeks while it grew in its new blood supply. They'd then sever it from its original point of uh, connection and with this arm could now move anywhere and the flap could be moved up onto the face and that's what you're seeing there. So Harold Gillies talks about plastic surgery as about always being a battle between beauty and blood supply and this, this was it. And these operations took dozens and dozens of procedures over many, many months but it led to the reconstruction of people who would otherwise have ne had nothing, nothing in the way of facial features really to come back to. So this vehicle which improves our capabilities in the air so much, does so by putting our uh, pilots at risk. Uh, and the mitigation for the risk and the injury that we subject them to becomes the birth of plastic surgery. And all of this is the same advance as any other advance, that we stumble forwards and we create as many problems as we solve, and we just solve the next problem. All of that is a necessary step towards this part of Anna Bagenholm's survival. She needs this helicopter. She, that helicopter can't land when it arrives at her scene, and it needs to pick her up out of the snow hole in which she is. And these are absurd vehicles. They are hugely flexible. They can fly along a couple of hundred miles an hour. They can stop dead. They can hover in the air. But in the hover, the aerodynamic principle of this thing is to chuck enough air at the ground hard enough that the whole thing just bounces back up into the air. Uh, and uh, it's why, for anyone who, tr who flies on these things professionally, you're trained very carefully in crash procedures, both over water and otherwise. What makes that such a capable vehicle? What is it that makes that so capable? And the answer to that is building greater power density into it. You need engines that look like this, uh, which are capable of clocking out a, couple of, uh, a few thousand horsepower. So the Wright Brothers fire engine was about 12 horsepower. The Hurricane aircraft that I showed you was about 1,200. This is getting on for 10,000. And it's this turboprop engine that gives you the ability to be this ridiculous vehicle that can do pretty much whatever you want it to do in the air. And it's this that's an intrinsic part of the immediacy with which you deliver healthcare later on. Now that trick of building more power density into a system, buying more capability, but paying the price of greater fragility is what all of this is about. That's what happens through the whole of the 20th century. We build systems with more power density, we make them more capable, they are in turn more fragile, and that's just the price you pay. And indeed, that is the true of, of Anna. You know, the reason that she is so fragile, the reason that all of you are so fragile but, and yet so capable is because of that. It's because you have your own version of a turboprop engine inside you, inside of you, inside of all of your cells, the thing that allows you to express the full potential of your DNA, your genetics code is these mitochondria that are so vulnerable. And that is what all of 20th century, 21st century medicine is all about. It's about coping with that fragility. We are extremely fragile. When you look at the extremes of the world, let alone those of the universe, we are absurdly fragile. Rubbish, really. Plus or minus one degree from 37 degrees, you feel pretty awful. Ascending vertically into the atmosphere on air, um, even if you climb and acclimatize, it's about eight kilometers. The summit of Everest, 8.7 kilometers or so, is the fundamental limit for human life unsupported. Getting in the water, breathing air off a tank, about 30 or 40 meters. That envelope, that physical envelope, that zone in which we're able to survive around the Earth is the th thickness of a sheet of paper around a basketball. It's tiny. And that's, but, but, that narrowness and that fragility is why you are what you are, the most complicated iteration of anything anywhere in the universe, sentient life. There is no other iteration of it anywhere else. So that's how you buy Anna's survival. You buy it with these accidental discoveries and advances all the way through. 
we have power within ourselves which makes us capable, renders us fragile. Now when you take on that challenge, when you scale that theme up and you look at what we did by the middle of the century, this is the Saturn V racing to the moon, 25,000 miles an hour it will achieve. And in terms of power and capability, unparalleled, also unparalleled fragility. And it is simply remarkable that we did this and we continue to try and do this. You should not be surprised when there are accidents in this endeavor. You should be surprised that everyone doesn't die every single time it happens. It's been a fast century of advance. You know, in the two million years of human evolution, we wash up at the start of the 20th century with life expectancies around the world, which are around about 30 years. In the UK, are around about 45 years average over men and women. 45 years is the average life expectancy in the 1900s. Life expectancy for a child born today, there's one in four chance that you'll reach the age of 100. Um, our expectations of survival are outrageous. I mean, I mean when, when you look in a modern hospital, what, is, what it is expected that you will survive, and you look at the start of the century, it is outrageous. When you look at the story of Anna Bagenholm compared to Scott, you see how ridiculous the rate of advance has been and where we are now. And the final defining aspect of how far we've come and how ridiculous our pace of achievement has been, that this is our target for exploration today. This is the place that we talk about trying to achieve sometime, hopefully, in the earlier part of this century. And compare that to 10 decades ago when this was it. 1912, this is it. This is the most daring thing that anyone has ever really done. And yet now our sights are set on that. I'm going to finish on this slide, and this is one of my favorite slides, because this is the crew of the fictional Starship Enterprise. And I show this because this is the Starship Enterprise. This is Space Shuttle Enterprise, the prototype shuttle that flew in atmospheric testing. So this is the fictional crew of a fictional Starship Enterprise, and this is the Starship Enterprise, science fact. And that is where we always stand at every epoch, on the edge between science fiction and science fact. Uh, and that's very hard to get used to, but that's where we always are. Thank you very much. <laughs>